Testing. One, two, three. Hi, this is Dr. Hefferly. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in class today, but in lieu of class, I am going to tell you all that you need to know um, for today using this software and posting this up on YouTube. So I'm glad you were able to open this and I hope you can follow along. Um, so let's get started. So this is our week schedule up on Moodle. And as you can tell, I posted up on Moodle that class will not meet today. I wanted you to watch this video and take notes off of the video. And the video will stay up there for the rest of the semester, so you can go back and look at it later. But I want you to watch it now, because you're not going to be in class, and um, I don't want you to waste time later on looking at it. I want you to look at it now when it's relevant. Okay, so once you're done watching this video and taking your notes, for participation credit, I want you to go down and click on this link at Mon Moodle for 930 participation. And that's where I want you to post all the questions that you can come up with for me. So you're going to get participation credit for posting those questions. You're going to post them up there before Friday to get that participation points. And that's also going to serve as attendance for today too. So in lieu of class, you get to ask all your questions in this link and you get credit for it, as long as you do it before Friday. You'll notice also up on Moodle, you'll see that um, your study session is Wednesday night at 5 p.m. in Burroughs 205. And Justin is gonna help you with managing this video and managing um, the questions from chapter five. On Friday, what to look forward to is we're moving on to chapter six. And you will use the worksheet linked below to take question or take notes on the question that I have for the day. So the worksheet is located right here. It's in Word format, so um, if you don't have Word on your computer, you can use a campus computer and it will open just fine there. Print it out or download it to your computer and fill it out. Um, bring, out bring the filled out worksheet to class with you on Friday. Okay? Email me at cheffer at wingate.edu if you have any questions at all about what's expected of you for this week. I know it's unusual. I know it's unexpected, uh, but life's unexpected. So roll with it, give it your best shot, and email me if you have questions or have any problems with it. Okay, so let's move on. Let's take a look at um, where we left off the other day, where we left off on Monday. So remember I had the PowerPoint up and you were giving me all kinds of great questions and great feedback on that question about the first empires. And we left off talking about the Charter of Human Rights that Cyrus the Great left us with. One of the first charters of human rights in all of world history came from the Persians. So unlike the 300 movie, the Persians actually were quite enlightened in terms of protecting the human rights of their conquered peoples. Empires are violent. Empires necessarily take away the right of people to rule themselves. For sure. So they're no saints, but they aren't quite as bad as they're depicted in the 300 movie. I'd like you to take out your books now. So take out your Worlds Together book. You are going to turn to the Behistun inscription, and that's where we left off. So that document was at the end of our chapter, at the end of chapter four. Um, all right, so. End of chapter four, page 153. So go ahead and flip to page 153. You can pause this as you read over it. What we're looking for is we're looking for evidence of how the Persian Empire was governed. Um, we're looking for some insight into these first empires in world history using the case of the Persian Empire as it was ruled under Darius I, who's pictured in the lower left-hand part of your screen. So, as with all primary sources, you need historical thinking information. I have some of it on the PowerPoint. Darius I is the Persian emperor who wrote this inscription. The inscription's title, or what it is, is the Behustun inscription. This was um, inscribed around 520 BCE. Okay. So that's the W information for it. We need to find some specific evidence from it. So as you're looking down, and you can see that each line is numbered, 
Page 153 in the left-hand column, you can see that it says, Saith Darius the king, these nine kings, he's using Roman numerals, I took prisoner within these battles. So he's basically talking about how he's the king of kings. He's the Shahanshah. He's the king who kidnaps or conquers other kings. And that's what an empire is. If you look down at 4.33-6, saith Darius the king, these are the provinces which became rebellious. The lie made them rebellious, so that these men deceived the people. Afterwards, Ahura Mazda put them into my hand, as was my desire, so I did unto them. So basically, he's saying that all of those conquered territorial states, they deserved it. Because they were ruled by the lie. That they were rebellious and led astray by a lie. And so, Ahura Mazda... The god of Zoroastrianism, which we're going to talk about in a minute, God put them into our hand. So very similar to the Neo-Assyrians, they are saying that their god, Ahura Mazda, gave the emperors of Persia the right to rule. Right there, right in that, that little piece of evidence. God punishes rebellions and gives them over to Darius. The rest of that is he's talking about how Ahura Mazda, the god of of the Persians gives him the power, gives him the right, how he is fulfilling Ahura Mazda's will. Darius is not saying that Darius is God. Very differently, he is carrying out Ahura Mazda, God's will here on earth. He says, May Ahura Mazda, God be a friend unto thee, and may family be unto thee in abundance, and may thou live long. He's wishing his conquered people goodwill. As long as they don't rebel and as long as they follow God, um, they're, he's basically wishing them blessings. Okay, so those are some of the most important things to get out of the Behustun inscription. If you have questions about what you read there, post them up on Moodle. Let's move on to talk a little bit more about what the textbook says about the Persian emperor, Empire. So, what new things they add on, right? They don't want the rebellion that brings down the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So they divide up their empire into provinces or states that they call satrapies. So they have 20 states and basically one imperial government over those 20 states. In those satrapies, the emperor is going to appoint some of his most trusted friends to sit in charge as governors or satraps over those states. So it's kind of like the United States, where you have the imperial government, and then the imperial government rules and has imperial laws, and then you have local laws set by the, gov the state governments, and the state governor is in charge of those. What holds it all together is a network of royal inspectors or spies who spy on the satrapies and make sure that they're being run in accordance with the emperor's will and that those satraps are not fomenting rebellion. Um, they're trying to prevent what happened to the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So they're trying to improve things. They also add one more thing. The Neo-Assyrians started this, but the Persians really expanded. A royal highway to get troops from one part of the empire to the other. And they have a, a highway that cuts right through the middle of the, Rome, of the Persian Empire. They're going to get troops quickly to put down rebellions, but they're also going to use it for communication and to improve trade, to, to improve the economy of the Persian Empire and bring in a lot of wealth and bring in a lot of those taxes that they're collecting from all other states. Okay, let's move on now. Let's talk a little bit about the culture of the Persians, their faith. So their religion, their state religion, was called Zoroastrianism. And you had a question, a second question from Monday, that asks you about what Zoroastrianism is compared to Judaism. Now these are two of the most ancient faiths in the world. They're still around today, still believers of both today. There are much less Zoroastrians though there, than there are Jewish people. So Zoroastrianism is based on the teachings of the founder of Zoroastrianism, a prophet called Zoroaster. The Greeks called him, Zer or sorry, the Persians call him Zarathustra, and the Greeks call him Zoroaster. So the same guy. He lived approximately around 1000 BCE, and he wrote down a series of hymns that were repeated by his priests and his followers for several centuries. Um, so he uh, spoke in a um, Persian language, which is Indo-European. And in his hymns, 
he speaks about his beliefs. So in these writings, he um, talks about the key beliefs that he is professing. He is the the prophet of Zoroastrianism. So the most important belief is that there is one God of truth and goodness, and that is Ahura Mazda. Only one God. And he's the God of goodness, truth, justice, righteousness. Um, so Ahura Mazda is the God of good. And Ahura Mazda judges all people. If the people follow him in being good, doing good things, acting fairly, treating people fairly, speaking the truth and speaking with honesty, then Ahura Mazda is going to reward them with an afterlife in heaven, a very happy afterlife. So this in world history is one of the earliest mentions of a heaven. So even, even though the Egyptians believed in an afterlife, it wasn't necessarily a heaven, a different place. Zoroaster introduces this idea of a heaven, an afterlife that rewards you for the good you do on earth. Now the judge, Ahura Mazda, the God that judges, if you do not follow Ahura Mazda, if you lie, you cheat, you steal, you treat people unfairly, you follow an evil spirit, an angry spirit called Ariman or Angramanyu. So think of Ariman as angry man, evil man, kind of like a devil kind of a, fi a figure. So there are two opposing spiritual forces. One is a god, one's a spirit. Ahura Mazda is a god. Ahriman is an angry spirit, an evil spirit. And Ahriman leads people astray, leads people, tempts people. If you're a follower of Ahriman, an evildoer, God or Ahura Mazda will judge you and cast you into hell, where you will be punished for your sins. Sound familiar? It should. This is one of those foundational belief systems that influences much of Western civilization. All right, so that's the basic of Zoroastrianism. We call this a dualistic kind of a religion, that good is versus evil, there's a heaven and a hell, a judgment for all souls, resurrection for the good people into heaven at the end of this lifetime. So some beliefs that will crop up in other major world religions that are the heirs to Zoroastrianism. The key Bible or text, sacred text of this religion is the Gethas. And they are written right around 1000 to 600 BCE. And the Persians are going to use these and, and they're going to promote this belief system across their empire. But they are also believe in religious tolerance. So they are going to tolerate Jews and other believers of other religions. Um, so this religion does not say that... Um, if you worship other gods, you're going to go to hell. It says if you are a liar, you're going to go to hell. If you do evil things, you go to hell. So it is a little bit more tolerant than some other religions. The group in today's world that still practices Zoroastrianism and, and chants the Gethas are the Parsis. So the Parsis live in parts of India, Pakistan, um, and Iran. So they're still around today. There's still some actually in the United States who've immigrated here. So that's a small number. Not that many people practice that faith anymore. So that's the official religion of the, the Persian Empire. Now Judaism originates and is written down around the same time period as Zoroastrianism. And, and Jewish people knew Zo Zoroastrians. So there is definitely... Um, I think mutually learning from each other, these two belief systems. For Judaism, I'd like you to take a look on page 137 in your textbook. And you'll see on page 137 um, a map. And this is going to be for the map section of the next test. I want you to know where in the world Israel is located. Most of you know already, but some don't. So Israel is located in ancient Palestine kind of in the Middle East between Egypt and Mesopotamia, conquered by both at various times. I want you to know where Jerusalem is. You can see Jerusalem there near the Dead Sea. And I want you to know where Phoenicia is. So Phoenicia is located right here on this map, and you can see it on your map as well. 
On my map, you can see the Kingdom of the Philistines, also called the Sea Peoples in your book. Philistines were real people. So were the Phoenicians. The Jewish people called the Phoenicians Canaanites. They called this Canaan, this area. So all of these people are mentioned in the Bible, the Jewish and the Christian Bible. All right, so that's your map on page 137. The ethnicity of Jewish people, so Judaism is a religion, the ethnic group are Hebrews. So Hebrews speak a version of an Aramaic language, so that's a branch of the Indo-European languages, Aramaic. They tell their own story in their Bible, um, and they say that they, west, they immigrated from Ur, so they were in Sumer, in ancient Sumer. So they are originally Mesopotamian, and they migrate um, through the Middle East. And according to their own history, in their Genesis story, they tell the story of their founding father who makes a covenant with God Abraham. And Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And the Bible also talks about their heirs, Jacob, and tells a lot of different stories about the core believers who make a covenant, the descendants of Abraham, who make a covenant with God. And Abraham and his people, his clan, migrate through the Middle East. At some point in time, they say that they were in Egypt, that they were enslaved in Egypt. They go there fleeing a famine, and we saw how climate makes people move. So the Jewish people were fleeing, fleeing climate change too. They flee to Egypt, and there they say they are enslaved. They say they escaped. Um, they said that they were led in this escape by Moses, which is an Egyptian name. And the part of the Bible that tells that story is called Exodus. That's the movement um, to their promised land, to Canaan, where they are going to take it away from the Canaanites, of whom are the Phoenicians. So they conquer that territory, and they say that God gave it to them, that this is the promised land God gave to them. So they brutally conquer that area. They take away part of it from the Philistines, too. And they commit a gen genocide. They even say this. They kill men, women, and children to seize their land. Along with this kind of political movement of seizing land in the Middle East, their Bible, of course, talks about their beliefs. And we have an example from their Bible um, uh, in our own textbook. Like I said, the Bible talks about um, their relationship with the Canaanites and the Philistines. Remember the Ten Commandments um, source that we read? So the Ten Commandments tell about the Jewish belief system. Um, and they are evidence for the monotheistic revolution. That there is only one God. And that evolves over time. So the revolution doesn't happen overnight. Um, in the early parts of the Bible, the Jewish people seem to believe that their God, Yahweh, is just their God, the God of the Jewish people. The, the God, Yahweh, is the God who created a covenant with Abraham. But there were other gods at the same time. It, um, other gods exist, but Yahweh is the God of the Jewish people. Eventually, though, they are going to evolve a belief and say that there is only one God a God of all, but that's going to take time, about a thousand years. In the beginning, they believe that their God is their God and the other gods exist too, and that they should only worship that one God, although other gods exist. Okay. Um, so they conquer and take away the land of the Sea Peoples, the Philistines, and the Canaanites, who are mentioned in your book, and they form their own kingdom called Israel. And that kingdom only lasts about 200 years, founded under King David. They have a few other kings, Solomon among them. Eventually that kingdom splits into two, they weaken, and they're enslaved by the Babylonians and the Neo-Assyrians, and they're hauled off to Babylon. And they're gone. They're out, of the middle, they're out of Palestine, out of Israel, and living in Babylon again, in Mesopotamia, for about 300 years. Now, in articulating their core beliefs, I want to go a little bit more into their monotheism, their god, they spell out the name Yahweh, but um, they don't say it. They, they don't believe that they should speak the name of God. 
They believe that this God made a covenant with Abraham and Abraham's descendants. They're the Jewish people, Abraham's descendants, the Hebrews. And in that covenant, the people of Abraham um, agreed to worship only one God and to follow God's laws, and in exchange, that God would bless them in this lifetime. So, in the Ten Commandments, they were given a moral code, and that was document 3.3. We read in Genesis their beliefs about um, what Yahweh told them to do, that they should um, procreate and cover the earth, that human beings should have lots of kids, and they should dominate the earth, um, control the earth. And the Ten Commandments is that moral code about what they should not do, like they should not commit adultery, and they should not steal, and etc. So they have a moral code. And it's written down in their Torah, their Book of Laws. So their sacred book is not only telling their history, but is also a book of what to do and what not to do. And they think if they follow what God or Yahweh tells them to do, that they will be blessed in this lifetime. The early writings of Judaism say nothing about an afterlife. So we have very little idea of what they think happened to people when they died. They believed God judged people punished evildoers and rewarded those who continued the covenant but they don't they believe that punishment happened in this lifetime so if someone was poor they would believe that that God was punishing them with poverty not um, you know it had nothing to do with the afterlife eventually over time most Jewish people today do believe in an afterlife and in heaven and in hell but that's a much later evolution and probably influenced by Zoroastrians because they interacted. The Zoroastrians freed the Jewish people to move back to Israel after the 500s BC where they started to write down their Bible. So we believe that part of the later writings of the Bible were influenced by Zoroastrianism. So you see there's similar beliefs but slightly different. There's not really a mention of a devil in early Jewish beliefs either. And that doesn't evolve until much later on, again, probably in relationship to um, talking with Zoroastrians and the to two beliefs combining to a certain extent. You know, people learn from each other and they try to figure things out together. All right, if you have questions about those primary sources, let me know. Um, oh, before we move on to India and China, I do want to say one more thing about um, Zoroastrians, and I forgot to put that down on this, this document. If you skip ahead to chapter 5, which is assigned for Friday, um, on Monday I did tell you to take a look at the document for um, Zoroastrianism. That's 5.1. So let's flip to that. This is page 190. So write this down under Zoroastrianism in your notes. The Gethas from the hymns of Zoroaster. The dates there. Okay, I gave you that on the outline. You can see that there, the Gethas. But I didn't go over what those core beliefs were in that primary source. So you do need to bullet point a few of those where you find that. So you see the rat, Ratu just means judge. Um, shall deal perfect justice to all. So God is going to deal out justice. God, Ahura Mazda is the God of justice, judges all. To the good who choose the truth and also to the evil who choose falsehood, God will be the judge of those. He who is most good to the righteous, be he a noble peasant or dependent, so no matter what your status is, um, God is going to judge you as equals. So you could see a little bit in Zoroastrianism this idea that people are equal under the sight of God. You're only judged by your moral character, not by how much wealth you have. And all the way through there you can see they say they're praying to Mazda. So Mazda is short for Ahura Mazda. Um, some other things I have outlined there um, Mazda is the spirit of truth and the good mind. Um, spirits of perfection and immortality. Let all advance to thee, O Mazda. Let all promote the cause of truth. 
And remember back with Darius, Darius keeps saying he is is promoting the truth. That his enemies and the other countries he conquers, they promoted lies. So you see, he's he's relating his empire to good versus evil. That the Persians are good promoting good, the truth, and the enemies are evil promoting the lie. Okay? And that's it from that, that document. There wasn't a lot of evidence, but I did want to just point that out from Zoroastrianism. Let's move on. So the second half of chapter 4 talked about India and China. And so I do want to address these two questions. So the first question is about India's culture, and we call that Vedic culture. And your book is talking mainly about the beliefs of Vedic culture. Okay, We had some primary sources before we already covered that um, are primary sources on that, so we'll go back to those. You see I put on this question here, and you write this down for India. They were not an empire yet in chapter 4. They'll get an empire later, but this is not an example of an empire. I just want to be clear on that. They are not an empire. They're still little kingdoms, territorial states. So they're not an empire in India in this time period, roughly um, between the 1200s and the 600s BCE, like what we've been talking about that time. China had an empire. So question two asks about China um, and their empire and their culture of their empire, the Zhang Empire and the Zhou Empires. So they are an empire, so we will talk about China's empire as it relates to Persia's empire. Okay, so let's deal with that question, China, first. Now you've got a map in your um, your textbook, and um, that shows you the Zhang Dynasty, the Zhang Empire versus the Zhou. All right, so take a look at that map. Um, I thought I had that map up here, but I guess not. So if you flip in your book in chapter four, let's take a look at China. Sorry, I didn't write down the page number for that map. It's on page 144. This map is 144. Okay. So you can take a look at that. That's where we've got some specific evidence on China. All right. Now, many of you will have know quite a bit about China. But a lot of you might not know anything about Chinese culture. So this question is saying, um, what's the root of the distinctive features of Chinese culture? So to answer this question, you need some notes on China today. So you might already know some things, but I'm going to show you this little video clip here. Hopefully it's going to play and, um, and work for me. Um, so with this video, it's a YouTube video. Okay, let me see if it's going to let me, no, shoot. I'm not sure if you're seeing this. Adam Jones, one hoped you were dead. Okay, just a second, give me a minute here to deal with my technology issues. Escape. Okay, sorry about that. Let me go ahead and um, show you this video. Hopefully this will show up. Okay. Um, here we go. Information on China. What is China? The People's Republic of China, commonly known as China, is located in East Asia. It borders 14 nations more than any other country in the world. It is the most populous state in the world with over 1.3 billion citizens, while the world population is 6.8 billion. That means out of every five people in the world, one is Chinese. China is made up of 56 distinct ethnic groups, with 10 Chinese making up 92% of its whole population. China is a single party state governed by the Communist Party of China, whose power is enshrined in Chinese constitution. China is officially an atheist country, 
its religious roots lie within Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. And from these, most social and moral values are derived. There are also a significant number of Chinese Muslims who arrived via the Silk Road trade route and still retain their own distinct culture. History China is one of the world's oldest civilizations, dating back more than five millennia and was ruled by successive dynasties until 1912. During this time, many great discoveries in the fields of science and technology were made, including the inventions of printing, paper, gunpowder, and the compass. This period also saw the construction of many landmarks, such as the Great Wall, which stretches over 4,000 miles, equals to 30 written travels from London to Pamao, gained the control of mainland okay. China in 1949, and established little, the People's um, Republic of China. Issues here with the my technology. China is as much shaped by its past as it is Okay. I'm not sure if you were able to hear or see all of that. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about China and seeing that video, you can go to YouTube and type in Introduction to China in 10 minutes, and that should show up. So you have um, some information on China today. Okay? Just wanted to get, get you a little bit familiar with China today. So. Much of Chinese culture dates back to their first empires. The Zhang, which was mentioned in an earlier chapter, um, date back to about the 1700s BCE. And they go through that, that terrible drought, and they fall apart because of that drought and, um, and famine um, after the 1200s. So that climate change helps to undermine the Zhang, and they're actually overtaken by the Zhou. Our primary source on the first Chinese empire, the Zhang, is actually in chapter 3, 3.5. So take out your book and flip to chapter 3. Okay? So this is on page 116. The title is Advisor Zichan of Zheng's Compilation of Laws. And this is a Zhang um, document, primary source. Um, written around the 6th century BCE, but it's talking about this ancient Zhang advisor. All right. Once you have it, we need to have some specific information about it. So what this is telling us about the laws, these are the, some of the things I highlighted on page 116. In the past, former kings consulted on affairs to decide them, but did not make penal compilations or laws, for they feared that the people would grow litigious that they'd be suing each other and be focused too much on the law and not on what the emperor was telling them to do. Still unable to control them, they restrained themselves with rightness, bound them with good governance, and raised them with humanness. They institutionalized emolements and ranks to encourage their obedience and determine strict punishments so as to overawe the perversity. So basically the government of the Zhang are trying to lead by example. They don't want to have too many legal codes in the beginning um, because they want people to follow what the king says. They want the king to decide everything. They want people to be in awe of the king and respect the king. They don't want people to think that they know best because they know the law. So what this primary source is telling us is that the Zhang are trying to keep for the king all judicial authority and really be absolute rulers what the king says, what the emperor of the Zhang Empire says goes. Okay? So, unlike the Code of Hammurabi, the Chinese are not writing down all of their decisions. They don't want to give the people that much power. They want the emperor to be free to make any decision he wants to make. But to lead by example, to be a good person, and to have everybody follow that good example. Now, the Zhou are going to take advantage of the drought, and they are going to topple the Zhang Empire, and they're going to enlarge this empire. So you can see the Zhou dynasty is much larger. So it's a, the dynasty is a series of emperors or series of kings. So the Zhou family, that's the family name. Zhang is the family name. The Zhou is the family name that rules for um, several hundred years in China. And the Zhou dynasty is just going to build on top of what the Zhang had already... Um, introduced, they're going to add a few new things. So King Wu is the, the Zhou family leader who is able to unite a whole bunch of different states under his control. About 70 different states under his control and in his empire. 70 different little countries in China. 
And like the video said, China is very ethnically diverse, and it was even more diverse back in ancient times. Many, many different languages, many, many different ethnicities in China. King Wu, though, is going to try to unite China under one culture in one empire. One belief he is going to promote for all of these diverse ethnic groups is that the emperor of China has the mandate of heaven. So he tries to introduce this idea that the heaven, or God, gives the emperor the right to rule. And as long as the emperor does the right thing, is a good role model, takes care of his people, that the gods will continue to give him the right to rule, or the mandate of heaven. If, like the Zhang kings, King Wu said the Zhang kings were doing evil things and were treating the people terribly, the heaven withdrew its mandate from the Zhang and gave it to King Wu. So it's a way of explaining and justifying his right to rule over all these different governments, all these different territorial states. And the mandate of heaven is going to be claimed by Chinese emperors all the way until the 20th century. It's going to be this religious belief that God gives the emperor the right to rule is going to be foundational to the legitimacy of Chinese governments until the 20th century. So the Chinese party topples that idea. The Communist Party topples that idea. Another thing that King Wu and the Zhou are going to give to the Chinese people is this idea that the Chinese Empire is the middle kingdom of the world, the center of the universe, the Zhanggo. So this idea that China, the Chinese Empire, those 70 states are at the heart of the whole world and that they are actually superior to the rest of the world. That they are more advanced. Everything else is on the periphery. They are at the core. The core of civilization, the core of perfection is the Chinese Empire. Trying to give people a sense of pride in this common Chinese culture that the Zhou tried to promote. They create a glorious capital city at Chang'an, and that's also um, on your map. Today it's called Xi'an, so you can visit it today. It's a major tourist attraction because it's the ancient capital of the Chinese Empire, right? The old capital, the modern capital is Beijing. Xi'an is another part, um, oh, quite a ways away, more toward the middle of, of China. And you could visit today and see the remnants of that very early imperial capital. So everybody funneled their tribute in taxes to Chang'an and they, they sent that tribute down canals that were built by the Zhou. The canals facilitated tax collection and trade. Each state, each of those 70 states, so you know we have 50 states in the US, they had 70 states. Each one had a lord, a provincial royal family, um, a nobility, a royal family, and that lord had to report to the emperor and bring all the taxes to the emperor and do what the emperor told him to do. But each lord could rule over his own state as he saw fit. However he wanted to collect taxes, he could do that and create his own laws for each of those states. So there's still quite a lot of diversity in China allowed by the Zhou and that actually worked against them. They allowed too much freedom to each of those states and eventually those states rebelled in a civil war and they overthrew the Zhou and they devolved into a warring states period again. All right, so that's the early Chinese Empire, so quite different from the Persian Empire. India didn't even form an empire. Now, India today, I think a lot of you have an idea of what India is like. I have a video that I was going to show you in class on India today. Um, if you go to, to YouTube, um, you can type in the search term that I had for it. I'd rather you just do that. So if you go there, um, type in in quotes in YouTube, India, Indian is full of culture. Indian is full of culture. And that should give you the little clip that I was going to show you. It just shows you India today so you get some seeds. It's just too difficult to do this with the software I have for showing you this lecture. So I'm going to skip it. It's called Indian is full of culture. Okay, so the India of old, we're talking about the subcontinent of India, 
which would include Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, okay? All of that is part of ancient India, and they are going to be colonized by the Vedic Indians, okay? The Vedic culture. Um, all right, so let me get back to my PowerPoint here. All right, in your book, in Chapter 4, it talks about um, Vedic culture spreading across the Indian subculture. And it's spread by the Vedic Aryans um, or the Vedic people. Based, they have this culture at the heart is the Vedas, their sacred texts. So they were nomadic originally, and they were very good horseback warriors. Warriors were held in the highest esteem in this culture. And the warriors would elect their own kings or chiefs, which they called Raha, right, or Raja. So the, the Raja are the leaders or the kings of these nomadic people. They come in and they conquer the native Indians who are called by eth um, anthropologists Dravidian Indians. So Dravidian ethnic groups are very dark skinned, almost black skinned, black hair, black eyes, and they're believed genetically to be the original native Indians of India. They're conquered by a lighter skinned group. So the Vedic peoples are lighter skinned, light brown. They're, they're Indo-Europeans. They're from the Black Sea area, just like the Ar Iranians, the Persians were, just like the Greeks were, right? So they're Indo-Europeans who move in. They displaced the Dravidians who suffered from that drought and, and their society collapsed. They used the military technology of the Indo-Europeans, the iron technology and chariots, to conquer them and they bring their own language, which they write in Sanskrit. No, to the right there you can see an example of Sanskrit. That's the, the language of the Vedic culture. It's got a lot in common with other European and in, um, uh, Indian languages. And their name, Vedic culture, is named after the Vedas, their hymns and prayers that are mentioned in your chapter, which were written down around the 400s BCE. What we know of their society, we can tell from the Vedas. Their earliest written forms were their sacred books, the Vedas. And in the Vedas, they outline the basis of um, uh, caste distinctions that we see in India today. So. Different families belong to different castes, or varna, as they were originally called. These are inherited racial and class categories. So, for example, um, if you are in the shudra caste, today in India, there are certain occupations that are labeled shudra. That's the lowest caste. And they are considered the least clean. They're, they're valued in society, but... They are normally the poorest people, and they're normally the darkest caste. So the darker skinned people inherited the lower castes, and the lighter skinned Vedic people were the higher castes in this society. In the Rig Veda, we have that as a primary source in chapter 1, 1 1.1, in the sacrifice of Purusha, we see in their creation story how the, the Vedic Indians believed that God or gods created the caste systems. So let's flip to 1.1. Back in chapter 1, the creation story from the Rig Veda, the Vedic culture. They say Purusha, this lord of immortality, is divided up into humanity. And again, this is on page 38 good primary source on Vedic culture. Purusha's mouth, this is the right hand side on page one, uh, page 38. When they divided Purusha, his mouth became the Brahmin. The Brahmin are the priestly caste, the highest caste. The Brahmin are the teachers, the professors, and the priests. His arms were made in Rayana. The Rayana are the Raya, the warriors and the chiefs, the kings, are actually the second caste. They're in charge of defending the people. His two thighs, the real center of the body, are the Vaisha. And those are the farmers, the peasants, the businessmen, um, the people who do trade, the merchants. They're all the Vaishas. They're like the middle class. 
And then his, t his feet, the, the base of society, the lowest caste, are the Shudra. And that would be the servants, the landless people, the workers. The Shudra would also include slaves. Okay, so the caste system, or the Varnas, come from the Vedas, their sacred texts, their religious beliefs enshrine the inequality, fundamental inequality of Vedic society. Now in chapter 3 we had another document, the Code of Manu. Now the Code of Manu is in, comes from another sacred book. So let's flip to 3.4. 3.4 is on page 116. The title, the what is the Code of Manu? When? Circa 200 BCE. If you looked at the introduction to that, um, this is considered some of the earliest laws of the Vedic people. They were written down in Sanskrit in about 2,700 verses. And these are revered as if they're sacred. So, page 116, these are what the Brahmin caste, the, the priests, are going to teach. And some evidence from that is, again, the great sages approached Banu, who's a god. Um, and having duly worshipped him, the priests, the Brahmins, spoke as follow. Divine One, declare to us in due order the sacred laws of the castes, the Varnas. So this again elaborates on Varna. Um, and what Manu says then is he's going to talk more about the, va the Varna, but this specific excerpt is going to talk about the role of women in the caste system. So no matter what caste you are, if you're a woman, what is it that you're supposed to do according to God, Manu? And according to this God, women must be kept in dependence by the males of their families at all times. Women must never be independent according to Vedic culture. The father protects women in childhood. The husband protects her in um, when she's um, a, a middle-aged. And when her husband dies, her sons protect her. A woman is never fit for independence. Women must be guarded against their evil inclinations. Women are weaker than men and more prone to sin, so men must at all times control their wives. So at all caste levels, no matter what caste you are, if you're a man, you must protect your wife, your child, but you must also control her and prevent her from becoming evil. So men are in charge in this society at all levels. Even if you're the lowest servant, if you're a man, you're above a woman. So very patriarchal, very discriminatory towards women, much like the Neo-Assyrians were. So that's a good primary source on them. Now, when we come back on Friday, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about Jainism and Buddhism, and they come from Vedic Hinduism. So Vedic Hinduism, Hinduism today is just like a groups of beliefs of the Indian peoples. Vedic Hinduism is not only shaped by the Vedas, like I just talked about, is also shaped by the Upanishads, and that's mentioned in your chapter 4. So I want to talk a little bit and clarify what the Upanishads are. The Upanishads are more sacred texts, more writing, and they elaborate on their beliefs. So these are Brahmins who are wondering about what happens to us when we die, wondering about the gods, so they're asking questions and they're writing down what they think the answers are. So Vedic Hinduism, the culture of the Vedas, is both polytheistic and monotheistic. And that evolves over time. It's polytheistic and they believe in thousands of gods. Thousands of manifestations of different gods. So there are literally hundreds of religious festivals in India today because they believe in many different gods. But they believe all those different gods are manifestations of one main god, one central god. And that god is Brahman. So Brahman is the idea that this one central universal god manifests itself in different gods at different times. And all the thousands of gods are all just different manifestations of one god, Brahman. Okay, so polytheistic and monotheistic. You can worship three different gods, but I'll see them all as different 
features of the one Brahman God. All right, so that's the beliefs about God. You can see here um, some of the festivals. There's the Lord Ram, um, that's one God. You can see I got I have at the, the bottom there Vishnu, the preserver God, who, who shows up as Lord Krishna and the Rama God. So there's different manifestations of God and they all have different names. At the bottom of the screen you see um, different manifestations of those gods, what they look like. Um, all right, so you've got a destroyer god here, and um, this is kind of some typical modern representations of, of them. They each have different temples, um, different festivals that they practice. And Indians can be very devout today, but Indians might not be devout and might not believe in any of these gods. There's quite a variety of religious beliefs in India today. One common thing, though, that um, in terms of their culture, it's the culture like they accept this, they culturally believe that everyone has a soul that is immortal. So every living being has a soul that is caught in a cycle of death and rebirth. All living creatures are born and die and then are reborn, are reincarnated. So souls are immortal, caught in the cycle of samsara that's the the name they have for reincarnation the cycle the endless cycle of the death and rebirth of eternal souls now their morality so the moral code for vedic hindus is the law of karma so basically for everything you do there's an effect everything you do and if you do a good thing the effect is going to be good and if you do a bad thing, the effect is going to be bad. And all souls carry this karma with them from life to life. So in this lifetime, maybe you did a lot of bad things. You're going to feel those effects in your future lives. So let's say, for example, you're a Brahmin in this life. You're a priestly caste and you don't do your duty. You do a bunch of bad things. In the next life, you might be reborn in a lower caste as a penalty or be reborn as an ant as a penalty for the accumulated effects of your bad actions. Dharma is your sacred duty, so the right thing to do. Dharma is um, good karma. It's doing your duty. So Dharma is good karma. You do the duty according to your caste responsibilities. So for example, if your caste is to be um, the uh, Rayana, you're supposed to be a warrior. Your dharma is to be a warrior, to join the army, to um, go out and kill the enemy. If you don't kill the enemy, you're not doing dharma. You're not doing your sacred duty. You're doing something bad, right? So it, what dharma is depends on your caste. It's your sacred duty for your specific caste. Doing the right thing for your caste, your duty. You do your duty, you have good karma. You don't do your duty, you have bad karma. I know these are kind of confusing for some of us, but I want you to be familiar with these terms because these are what is familiar to the billion Indians that live on this planet and that live in Charlotte and wing it with us. Another key belief, cultural belief, is this idea that there is a way out of samsara, of that continuing cycle, that your soul can be released and be one with Brahman. So there are certain ways that it's possible, it's not probable, but that it is possible for you to really achieve release from being reborn, and that would be nirvana or moksha, release, where you become one with God again and you no longer have to take on a physical form. Because if you think about it, death is pretty hard, it's painful. And even living is hard sometimes. Being born is painful for babies. So samsara is not all that great, and a lot of people want to be released from it. They want nirvana to be released and rejoin God again. So they're going to be searching for ways to do this. And Jainism finds a way, and Buddhism finds a way to be released from this samsara, from death and rebirth. So these are the ideas that are the, form the basis of Vedic Hinduism. Again, these emerge 
around the same time that empires are forming in China and Persia. But these are not forming an empire in India yet. These are just some of the foundations of their cultural beliefs. If you have questions about this, please just blast me with your questions. Post them all up on Moodle before Friday. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, because you need to understand this before you can answer the question for Friday about Jainism and Buddhism. Jainism and Buddhism, again, take the Vedic Hindu beliefs and they elaborate on them. They figure out a way out of samsara, out of the cycle of life and death and reincarnation. Okay, I know I threw a lot at you. I know that this is a lot to take in. You can always go back over and, and, and see what, what I said. I know I'm imperfect in this software. I don't use it very often, but this is an emergency situation. I have to be gone, so that's why I'm having you do this, and hopefully this will be the only time this semester that we'll have to do this remotely. All right, thanks for being patient with me. Again, email me or post your questions up on Moodle. I'll be happy to communicate with you. Go to the study session Wednesday night, and Justin will help you with some of this stuff too. All right.